Thank you very much, Mavis. Uh, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to be here uh, with you today. And uh, those of you uh, out in Zoom, uh, thank you for tuning in as well. As Mavis kindly uh, uh, mentioned, and as, as some of you know, when I've lectured, <laughs> lectured, here, lectured here before, I've been interested in the phenomenon of persuasion and have studied that uh, in really two very different contexts. Uh, one was uh, a study of Nazi cabinet ministers and the other uh, was a broader analysis of the phenomenon of persuasion. But today I'd like to approach this in a very different way and I'd like to discuss persuasion in the context of public health. How well is medicine able to uh, persuade the public about risks? It's a timely question because really now is the season of medicine's discontent. The meteoric development of COVID vaccines was greeted by misinformation and uh, death threats. Large segments of the American population continue to refuse vaccination because they feel that the vaccine is more dangerous than the illness, that the vaccine causes uh, autism, uh, and a whole host of, of other conspiracy theories. So what I'd like to do today is to give a lecture in two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, why our COVID communications failed, and I would argue that they failed miserably uh, in persuading people about treatment. And the second part discusses a truly remarkable and unknown instance where medicine succeeded in a similarly fraught time. You know, pandemics are frightening. Um, we aren't our best when, when we're frightened about things. Uh, we don't act rationally. And uh, so I picked another time long ago and far away where medicine actually uh, succeeded. So I'll talk about those two themes today. Well, to a certain extent, political and religious orthodoxy have always greeted medical advances with suspicion. The use of anesthesia during childbirth was felt to contradict biblical teachings in Genesis. Uh, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Um, uh, after uh, John Snow administered chloroform to Queen Victoria during the delivery of her eighth child, attitudes towards obstetrical anesthesia uh, became more accepting. But the real forerunner of rulers embracing medical advances occurred in 1768 when Thomas Dimsdale, yes, Thomas Dimsdale, <laughs> Thomas Dimsdale vaccinated uh, Catherine the Great uh, against smallpox. This was a watershed event for acceptability of vaccination. So the first lesson of effective communication about public health is that you must have a very public and enthusiastic endorsement by the country's leaders. If not, you are wasting your breath. Now, this in endorsement is important because vaccination advocates have always faced ignorance and fear. When cowpox was used to vaccinate against smallpox, cartoons such as this one by James Gilroy portrayed patients developing cow-like 
tumors. You can see it, um, cows growing out of the ears, the nose, the mouth, um, where else have I, um, the bottoms, um, there's a, somewhere a cow growing out of somebody's butt. Um, so um, these sorts of concerns about vaccination have always uh, been with us. And uh, when public health restrictions have been imposed to control pandemics, people have habitually become enraged. In 1918, during the influenza pandemic, thousands joined the Anti-Mask League of San Francisco to protest against wearing masks. And the protests focused on patriotism and guarding civil liberties. Again, this was, a, this was not a 21st century protest against COVID restrictions, but occurred a century ago when we were confronting a different pandemic. More recently in Sturgis, South Dakota, a, a half a million attendees defiantly attended a motorcycle rally. And the purpose was to demonstrate our heritage the Black Hills, Freedom, and Motorcycles. The, all of this was despite the rampant COVID uh, epidemic. And the rally was associated with a 700% increase in South Dakota COVID cases during the following month. So public health be damned. Why, why have we failed? Why did we fail so badly? Now, leaders always struggle with uncertainty and conflict. When COVID was first detected, few appreciated the implications. The data were unclear and contradictory. And even three years after COVID hit the United States, Anthony Fauci said, I did not imagine and I don't think any of my colleagues imagined that we would see a three-year saga of suffering and death and a million Americans losing their lives. So when information started to suggest this was a serious threat, our messaging was inconsistent and occasionally deceptive. For all of our vaunted progress in so many areas, Medicine has invested little on public health communication. This analysis on the right from just last month, February 2023, shows the consequences. Amongst the 20 countries most affected by COVID, the United States has the second highest COVID death rate. Now, perhaps some of you might be skeptical. Can we believe the data from Russia? Uh, Probably not. Um, what about some uh, developing countries? Can we believe those data? Well, but the point is that the U.S. infection rate and death rate far exceeds that in similarly developed countries whose data we do trust. Somehow, we failed to communicate risks and persuade people. We've completely failed in conveying how scientific knowledge accumulates. Science thrives on replication. I'm gonna try to get this going here. We dodge one direction and then the other, looking for new information and then testing it out. This is rather like swallows swarming. To a naive observer, it looks like the swallows don't know what they're doing, uh, but in fact they do. Most scientists acknowledge that their observations are tentative unless they are replicated in other labs. Thus, contradictory information about COVID or any other medical problem is to be expected and not criticized. The knowledge zigs and zags. The point is we test and shape our responses to data and not belief. So true scientists 
embrace uncertainty and admit that we may be wrong, that the verdict is still out. In contrast, poor scientists and regret regrettably some political leaders wrap themselves in certainty and ignore the contradictory evidence. So one of our problems is that we somehow can't convey this well to people. Um, We failed also because of fear. We began, we began panic buying uh, and thereby worsened the shortages. In any disaster, uh, people seek information and become obsessed with rumors. We become fearful of others, particularly strangers. The sites of hospitals uh, collapsing under the burden of COVID at a high mortality rate in health workers further terrified us. But the economic consequences of shutting down social interaction and commerce were also dire. The stock markets collapsed everywhere. The supply chain collapsed. Um, small businesses, uh, huge proportion, closed. So any leader would have to struggle with all of these things, uncertainty, evolving information, the challenge of communicating complexity, assuaging fear, and dealing with economic consequences. So yes, vaccinations and public health measures to counter epidemics have always been greeted ambivalently, but President Trump brought something new to the table. He merely made things up. This was something new to public health to deal with. President Trump denied the seriousness of COVID. Okay, at least in the beginning, it was unclear. He rejected public health measures. Again, other leaders might also have been reticent to embrace draconian measures, but he was unique because he advocated for bizarre and dangerous treatments. Uh, he extemporaneously mused about COVID treatments. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous light. Supposing you brought the light inside of the body, which you can do either through the skin or in some other way, a disinfectant. It knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection inside? So it'll be interesting to check that out. I'm not a doctor, but I'm like a person that has a good, you know what. <laughs> not, not only that, he retweeted suggestions for ineffective and dangerous treatments. He ignored the best expert advice and instead parroted opinions from sources who were already on the record for bizarre beliefs. One of his experts uh, quoted her belief that endometriosis is caused by sex with demons during sleep. <laughs> when, when he was questioned about his endorsement of such a doctor's COVID beliefs, the president pushed back saying, I think there are very respected doctors. So, so again, I'm trying to make, maybe it's not a subtle point, maybe I'm hitting over head with a hammer, but my point is that I don't think um, pushback against the economic consequences or uncertainty about the meaning, meaning of the COVID epidemic was what was so striking uh, about the, that administration. It was this embracing of very peculiar beliefs and making it up. Now, this is not unique to uh, contemporary times. Leaders' mulishness about medical treatment is, uh, has long been with us. Oliver Cromwell, of all people, died from malaria in 1658. Why did he die from malaria? He refused to take the quinine, purportedly because he didn't want to be beholden 
to the Jesuits who brought it from uh, the Andes to Europe. So why did COVID prevail? Many studies compared United States uh, mortality with that of other countries with similar per capita uh, income, education, and healthcare system. These studies suggest that had the United States employed comparable containment and vaccination efforts, hundreds of thousands of American lives would have been saved. We did not, so COVID prevailed, and the U.S. has one of the highest infection rates per capita. Recapping, we were partially at fault because of our early confusion when we encountered the infection. This confusion was augmented by inconsistent public health messages about COVID's transmission characteristics and the effectiveness of isolation and masking. But what was particularly galling to doctors was that truculent government leaders were unwilling to listen to arguments based on reason and instead just made things up. This was new to us. We've been so accustomed to basing clinical practice on controlled clinical trials and double-blind experiments that we just assumed everyone thought that way. We ran into fear and rage, distortion and denial when we had assumed that rational policies, policies shaped by data would emerge victorious. As a psychiatrist, I should be the last person in the room to believe that people behave rationally in, in the context of emotional crisis. In a crisis, people ignore things like data, structured abstracts, meta-analyses. Clearly, medicine has misjudged the persuasiveness of its arguments. So part two, it may be instru instru instructive to go back in time to 1945, a time of great turmoil, uh, and to look at an instance where medicine communicated and shaped some public policy in a remarkable way uh, at a time of great trauma. What led to success then? I am, of course, referring to Nuremberg, uh, it would be hard to come up with a more threatening time than the final years of World War II. Faced with 85 million military and civilian casualties and unimagined brutality, the Allies struggled to finish up the war and to hold the Nazi leaders responsible. They weren't going to allow a repeat performance of World War I where the Kaiser was merely allowed to abdicate and live out his life in Belgium. So should the Nazi leaders be summarily executed or should there be a trial? And if there was a trial, how should it be administered? The Nazi cabinet minister's guilt was foregone conclusion and their ensuing death sentences seemed inevitable there was actually little interest at all on the part of military leaders or politicians in trying to understand why the Nazi leaders had marshaled such a catastrophic war. Although some wondered about uh, what drove the Nazis and mused that no sane leader would have started the war, all viewed the trial as focused on punishment rather than understanding. That is, until Nuremberg Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson received an unusual letter on June 11, 1945. I discovered the letter when I was working in the Library of Congress uh, on my book, Anatomy of Malice. The letter called for the scientific study of Nazi war criminals. Signed by John Millett and seven of his colleagues, the letter urged obtaining thorough psychiatric histories, projective testing, and preserving the brains of war criminals after their execution. And uh, I just excerpted 
if and when the accused has been convicted and sentenced to death, it would be desirable to have a detailed autopsy, especially of the brain. Therefore, it is urged that the convicted be shot in the chest and not in the head. This is actually a very surprising letter coming at a surprising time. What politician, what leader would have the courage to say, yes, we need to understand? Um, the knee-jerk response is we need to, to punish, we need to execute. But somehow, this letter was effective. Jackson was receptive to the letter. And while he didn't exactly summon psychiatrists to Nuremberg, he was tolerant uh, of psychiatrists and psychologists working in the prison and studying the war criminal. He even allowed forwarding one of the Nazi brains to prominent American neuropathologists for examination. So I was aware of the letter's recommendations, but then I got interested in who wrote the letter. And I have to say, this was a giant rabbit hole uh, for me. Um, who were these uh, uh, eight people who wrote the letter? How did they get together? How was it so effective? Uh, I got a little obsessed by it. And uh, uh, I think one of, the, one of the key factors of the success of the letter was the recipient. Uh, Robert Jackson was an enormously gifted individual with an extraordinary le legal pedigree. He was a former United States Solicitor General and Attorney General and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, he took a leave of absence from the court to take on the colossal challenge of being the chief U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg. And a whole set of legal procedures needed to be developed uh, amongst the international uh, tribunal, the Americans, the Soviets, the British, the French. He was diplomatic and erudite. He listened carefully to court arguments. He was not a politician who made it up on the fly or trusted his gut instinct over that of his advisors and staff. As a result, he gave the Millet letter his dispassionate attention and support so the letter was at least partially successful because it reached a very special recipient. The second thing about the letter was its style. I excerpted it. It was a short letter. It was brief and non-adversarial. This was not a long dialectic screed framed with whereases and designed to put the recipient on the spot. So commonly today, organizations and regrettably scientific organizations write polemical, lengthy documents as if their words were fists that would compel action. In fact, the Mellet letter was written to reach an audience of one very busy, powerful, and fair man. Could this letter get his attention without setting off his hackles? So a key feature contributing to the letter's success was its authorship and sponsorship. If you only knew how long it took to put this slide together. Um, so who were the signers? All signers were members of a small, elitist, interdisciplinary professional society called the American Society for Research in Psychosomatic Problems. The society subsequently was renamed the American Psychosomatic Society, or APS. They met annually and valued careful reasoning and clearly described data. They were convinced that the most interesting research questions straddled professional boundaries, um, and so that psychiatry, medicine, neurology, uh, uh, pediatrics, anthropology, needed to talk to each other. This was an NGO before there were NGOs. Some might call it a cabal, except there was nothing hidden uh, uh, about their agenda. 
uh, they merely called out crucial research questions and tried to reach out to a receptive leader. So who were these guys? All were academic physicians from Johns Hopkins, Columbia, and Harvard. In those days, there were few medical researchers, and they certainly knew each other from boarding schools, college, medical school, and faculty life. Anybody recognize any of them? Uh, up here in the far left is Adolf Meyer, uh, was the founding president of the APS. In 1909, he became the first psychiatrist in chief at Johns Hopkins and was arguably the most prominent academic psychiatrist of his era and one who presciently called for empirical observation and psychobiology. Unfortunately, his writing style was notoriously opaque. Someone surreptitiously submitted a 160-word uh, uh, example of one of his sentences to the New Yorker where it won the weekly non-stop sentence competition. <laughs> Despite his writing style, he shaped American psychiatry in the mold of empirical observations that focused on the interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors. Given his writing style, he probably had little to do with the millet letters drafting, but his prominence certainly contributed to its success. To the right of Meyer is Tracy Putnam, also a president of the APS. In days in the 40s, the boundaries between medical specialties were more fluid. He managed to be trained in psychiatry, neurology, and neurosurgery. He was one of the co-discoverers of Delantin. Putnam continued speaking out on important issues even after Nuremberg and was vice chairman of the National Commission for Resettling Foreign Physicians after the war. Interestingly, he was forced to resign from Columbia in 1947 when he refused to obey, obey an order to fire all non-Aryan neurologists. So no shrinking violet uh, of an individual. To his right is Alvin Barak, a Columbia pulmonologist who helped improve oxygen tents and introduced portable oxygen uh, treatments for emphysema. He introduced HELOX or helium oxygen mixtures as a treatment for dyspnea and studied the effect of oxygen on mental functioning. Barak was an early advocate of pulmonary rehabilitation and was a keen observer of human behavior. He was associated with the Algonquin Round Table, the intellectual salon of the 1920s, and was sort of a doctor to the stars of the day. Not content with these interests and accomplishments, he was also a psychoanalyst. He psychoanalyzed Molly Harrower, who 30 years later delved into the Rorschach tests of the Nuremberg war criminals. But that's another story. To his right is Carl Binger, a Harvard physician who worked alongside Dr. Barak in pulmonary medicine and infectious disease, treating influenza casualties from World War I. After the war, uh, he continued studying pulmonary physiology and joined an expedition to Peru with Paul Dudley White to study acclimatization in uh, high altitudes. His work with pulmonary patients sparked an interest in um, psychological factors affecting breathing and dyspnea, and Binger subsequently became a prominent psychiatrist president of APS and editor of the journal Psychosomatic Medicine. He went on bravely and ineffectively testified against uh, the character of Whitaker Chambers in the Alger Hiss trial. And if those of you are interested in expert testimony, 
Um, uh, Carl Binger's expert testimony is notorious for uh, one of the worst expert testimonies uh, ever given. Uh, but that was later and in a different forum uh, uh, in a courtroom. Uh, underneath Binger is George Stevenson, a psychiatrist and neurologist, an advocate of the child guidance movement. Um, he um, was said to have had more continuous contact with the work of more clinics than any single individual in the country. His work ranged from community settings to research labs and gastroenterology. In his presidential address, he maintained that the splendid isolation in psychiatry, psychology, education, social work, correction, and other fields dealing with humans in need is very cramping and conducive to scientific stagnation. Next was Richard Brichter, a neurologist who helped establish the Multiple Sclerosis Association. He also studied behavioral deterioration of patients who sustained frontal lobe damage. Brickner was president of the New York Neurologic Society. A man of boundless energy, in 1943, he published Is Germany Incurable? Uh, and he wrote, as a responsible physician practicing neurology and psychiatry, I can say the national group we call Germany behaves startlingly like an individual involved in paranoia as grim and ill as mind is heir to. The uh, guy speaking in front of the New England Life podium is Frank Fremont Smith, a neuropathologist who became medical director of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. He was a lifelong supporter of interdisciplinary research uh, and had a special interest in cybernetics uh, and psychedelics. He was extraordinarily effective in bringing people together from different backgrounds to study issues that straddle boundaries. He was a noted philanthropist, a passionate advocate for scholarship, and a president of the World Federation for Mental Health. Very well connected politically, Eleanor Roosevelt commented, the other day I was talking to Dr. Frank Fremont Smith and I realized that the attitude that we held as children might very easily obstruct our ability to create a family of nations. Our subconscious prejudices, our reactions which we cannot even explain might create antagonisms which we do not consciously desire and for which we cannot even account. And I began to think that our next great study should be made in the use of psychiatry by people who wish to deal in public relations at home or abroad. In his obituary, the New York Times commented that Fremont Smith had been a world communicator throughout his professional life. And what of the last Certainly, you recognize that. Yes, you do. This is John Millat. Uh, perhaps you recognize the painting. It's in the San Diego Museum of Art, in the front lobby, to the right, in the permanent collection. We know a great deal about Millet from sundry sources. John Singer Sargent was his godfather and painted Millet's portrait as a four-year-old boy. Now, Millet's father, Francis Davis Millet, was a famous American artist who seemed to be on every museum's board of directors and whose murals graced public bu uh, government buildings uh, all over the East Coast. Sadly, Francis died on the Titanic in 1912. He had so many friends in high places that a memorial fountain 
uh, was installed on the ellipse near the White House in his memory. So John's uh, upbringing must have been as one of the cultural elite. By the way, Mark Twain was his father's best man. Um, so John eventually became a Columbia psychiatrist. Uh, he chaired an interest group that studied allergy and peripheral vascular disease. He initially worked at the Austin Riggs Foundation in Stockbridge, and in 1931, he founded the Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan, Connecticut. It continues to be a prominent, secluded retreat for psychiatric patients. One speculates that he must have encountered many prominent New England uh, families in his capacity. So all of these people were signees on the faculties of Columbia, Harvard, and Hopkins. They were leaders in foundations which supported medical research. They were leaders in psychiatry, neurology, uh, medicine. They thrilled with interdisciplinary um, research. They were leaders in many professional societies, the American Association of Mental Deficiency, the American branch of the International League Against Epilepsy, the American Neurologic Association, the American Orthopsychiatric Association. I could go on and on and on, but all of this leadership combined to give them a substantial voice and influence. So what have we learned? The great uh, uh, pathologist Virchow remind us that medicine is a social science. I think we've forgotten that. We've been so successful in cellular and molecular medicine that we think such truths are self-evident, and they are never self-evident, particularly in times of upheaval. I'm not gonna end up focusing on poor leadership either in Washington or in academics. We're stuck with the leaders we elect. On the other hand, we are responsible for our own failings. One of medicine's notorious failings is its reliance on jargon. Um, a recent study published last year examined how well patients understood the doctor's communication. And I excerpted uh, a couple of communications. And the doctor said, your blood test showed me that you do not have an infection in your body. 98% of patients get that. Your chest x-ray was unremarkable. Hmm. Uh, how many of us have heard that one? That's 80% get that. Your nodes are positive. The findings on the x-ray were impressive. What the hell does that mean? Uh, so we, we have difficulty with jargon, we're not taught how to communicate um, in a way that's not arrogant and that's not condescending. And I think we have continued doing that problem of poor communication when we talk to the public at large or politicians. But there's something else about the training of doctors that sucks the marrow out of our ability to communicate. We acquire a convoluted writing style. It might as well be written in code. Y years ago, I uh, was about to give a lecture, televised lecture to the community about some of my research on stress and heart disease. I worried if my slides would be clear and showed them to a, a friend who specialized in public health communication. She pointed out that the title typical scientific style of a uh, slide uh, is less clear than we think it is. Scientific style would say the effect of vaccination on, on mortality. What Jesse Grumman told me was that you need a pithier style and a, a title style that tells the person what the conclusion is. So in this instance, a public communication style would be vaccination lowers mortality. This kind of goes against the grain for scientists to be that direct 
Um, but uh, I think we, we need to adhere to these um, recommendations. Millet uh, has presented a succinct and clear recommendation to the government. That's very hard for doctors to do. Um, good scientists are cautious and diffident in presenting their data, but quacks are utterly sure of themselves. As the poet Yeats uh, said, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are all full of passionate intensity. The other issue of communication has to do with the complexities of conveying probability and uncertainty. Uh, this doesn't lend itself to sound bites. This doesn't help when we try to communicate with the public. Scientific inferences are based on probability. We need to find ways of communicating that we rarely hit a bullseye and that sometimes we get it wrong. People understand probability in the casinos. We need to do a better job of showing people how such knowledge applies elsewhere. Oddly enough, the National Weather Service has been preoccupied with this question for years. They were troubled by the fact that people ignored warnings. Used to be they would predict a hurricane and it came or it didn't come. And when it didn't come, there was a false alarm and people learned and were reinforced to ignore uh, warnings. They consulted with an Israeli social psychologist who in, remember your history, in 1973, Israel was quite interested in this question of false alarms and ignoring warnings. Uh, and uh, so he had his reasons for being interested in the weather service. But he encouraged uh, uh, conveying more the sense of probability and that people would understand it better. So if you look at a contemporary hurricane map, you see the further out in time, the less sure we are about the course of the hurricane. Everybody gets that. So there are ways of beginning to, uh, to convey probability, risk, uh, to the public, but we don't know how to do that. We haven't done that. If, when I think about my medical education, I don't think I don't think we had a single lecture on communication. Not a single one. So um, I appreciate your your listening to my harangue this morning. Um, the the uh, it's always been challenging to uh, persuade leaders to support medical advances, particularly when there are economic and political risks. We have a chance to be persuasive when we deal with an open-minded leader, and leaders are more likely to be influenced by clear, non-adversarial information, and it's more persuasive when it comes from a broad-based coalition of professional societies, foundations, and universities. Millet and all were persuasive in the context of enormous emotional turmoil. Perhaps we can emulate their approach today. Thank you.